If it's going to be a recording, you have to not ask me any controversial questions. <laughs> Just warning you about that. <laughs> Um, thank you very much to Bess for the invitation to, to say a few words here. Thanks everybody. Um, I'm just going to say a, a few things really about what, where I think um, DFID is on mini grids, what we understand by mini grids, uh, what we're looking at, how it fits in with the kind of programming that we've got in this area, um, and then hopefully leave five or ten minutes at the end of this is the time for questions rather than just talking for the whole period. So um, let me just launch straight in. So what do we understand by a mini-grid and why it matters and where it might fit? Um, this is a diagram from a study that we commissioned last year from the French consultants IED into the, the potential um, and the evidence for mini-grids in sub-Saharan Africa. It just sort of sets out the basic argument, which I think is the one. I'm interested in your thoughts on this as well, but the basic argument is you use a mini-grid where the community is far enough away from the grid and dense enough to justify um, making a mini-grid as opposed to a series of household systems, um, but not dense enough to justify a grid connection. So it's that kind of, it's filling the gap, I think as we would see it, in between the dispersed household systems, where it's not worth having a mini-grid, and the really big communities where it's worth having grid extension. So this is all crazy about the economics of this. Um, how you power that mini-grid is a separate question, and we'll, and we'll come to that in a second. Um, I think this is high time this kind of analysis was updated, but I think this still gives an indication. And this is the Inter International Energy Agency assessment uh, reproduced by the Sustainable Energy for All initiative of what investments are needed to create universal access by 2030. And basically what it sets out is a, is a balance between isolated off-grid, household, grid extension and mini grids. I think this was, when this came out, it was quite a surprise, I think, to a lot of people in the sector, just the size of the mini grid chunk. Um, I think when you look at different countries, as we did in this IED study, you find a lot of different um, outcomes. Um, it depends on a lot of factors. And I think that's why we need to, to, re to review this. But ultimately, I think the message is these three forms of support and forms of, of, of technology are the ones needed to create universal electrification. Um, this diagram it just makes the point in a slightly different way. Um, again, these three types of approach to electrification and then the fuels issue. And basically we're considering green mini-grids or low carbon mini-grids to be mini-grids which incorporate renewable energy of some type, um, either on its own or hybrid with diesel. We don't have, in our thinking, any minimum percentage but with a clear direction of travel towards cleaner, wherever that makes sense. Again, it's about the economic argument for how that um, system is most economically powered. Um, on a kind of levelised cost basis, we do try to think in that forward direction rather than just you know, the cost today and what then we can do to make that work in terms of financing. Um, this diagram is just really to show some of the factors that can de determine the, the viability of different power sources for mini grids. Um, and I, I, I'm not saying this is the be all end all, just says that depending on fossil fuel subsidies, depending on um, the price, depending on the, the energy resource, you come to a different conclusion about what the, the power uh, should be. And, and typically, we're not wanting to make a decision about that. That's not for us, that's for the project promoter, that's for the developer. Um, who you know, can take that kind of decision. Um, we've been doing a consultation into this area since November 2012. Uh, we started out, we had a consultation meeting down in London, we had another one in Glasgow, we had a number internationally, and we kind of pulled out the sector barriers, which for many of you will, will sound horribly familiar, um, but I just, I guess, wanted to briefly say, many grids, they've been around for a long time. Everybody, everybody is, is, is aware of them. Why have they not yet had this, the kind of impact that other technologies, and I think probably most prominently the solar lighting sector in recent years, have started to see in terms of scale up? Um, the first one is about regulation policy gaps or uncertainty. Um, Many grids are much more sensitive to, um, to policy issues than solar lights. They are products, you sell them, they fill gaps like water in a way, whereas mini-grids are a bit of infrastructure which sit on the ground and 
they're influenced by whether or not the grid's going to arrive or not, whether you're not sure about that, what the tariffs are. People don't ask what the kilowatt hour cost of power through a solar light is, but they do ask what it is sometimes through a mini grid. Um, there's still a lot of fragmentation, unmade linkages, many grid companies out there, still to, to my perception, I'd be interested in your views again, are doing everything themselves. There's not a lot of you know, replicability, there's not a lot of standard components, there's a lot of competing up from scratch. Um, capacity issues and lack of standardisation, still of course we're dealing in rural communities, in poor countries, and there's, there's few things you can just, you can just stamp out, so you still have to rethink and redesign each time, which adds cost and complexity. Business models, it's still, although I think there's now starting to be a few examples of many big companies who are making money out of this and expanding, but it's still quite a few and probably mainly in Asia at the moment. I'm really interested to hear about the experience from this research. Um, and then affordable longer term finance. Well, however you cut the mini grid sector, it seems like you've got to, raise, you've got to get debt. You've got to be able to finance the building of a quite big bit of infrastructure to then get paid back over time. <coughs> so one way or the other, and that has to happen. And to, to, to a large extent, it seems like banks and lenders are still not really um, in this sector. So we looked at this sector and we said, okay, there's a big opportunity here for filling the gap and expanding energy access, that's the big objective. What, what can we do to try and get this moving? And um, well, what, what struck us is a few different things came up, and, pro and these are that there are a number of different barriers, specific contexts into the play. So depending where you are in your project, you have a different barrier. If you're just starting out, you need a resource assessment. If you're towards the end, you might need your financing. You might still be communicating with the community and then not have a uh, um, and have problems there. So lots of different stages in the project cycle where you can get stuck. Um, each country has a very different regime in terms of the tariffs, in terms of the, what the utilities like, whether you're allowed to sell power, all these kind of variables. By technology, obviously, the different technologies are in different stages. The sub-technologies like the metering, like the power management, which have different characteristics. And then by segments, um, we, we are presenting and thinking about mini grids as a, as a segment, as in, the, in the ramp. Um, and there's a definition which I think the high impact opportunity I'll talk about later has, which is basically everything in between household and the grid. But if you look at the, diff if you look at the challenges faced by, um, say, Mwenga Hydro in Tanzania, hydropower with a grid connect and a, um, and a, a group of houses, a mini grid, that's totally different from uh, Meragav in India, microgrid, DC power, 30 houses at a time, that kind of model. And, and then, then in between you have a number of different models, like your Enensis, the German firm, um, you know, who produced kind of looks like the grid, diesel, solar hybrid in that 100 to 1 megawatt scale. So there's, 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 there's different companies, there's different challenges, and so coming up with a kind of a program of support has to take those issues into account somehow without having too many moving parts and too much complexity. Before I come away from complexity, I'll show you another bit of complexity, which was our analysis of the situation in Tanzania in terms of the barriers to mini-grid project development. And if you imagine, we were kind of conceptualizing this as in two ways. One is community-led. So if you were going to try and do a community-led mini-grid, how would you, what, what is, what's your cycle to get into a building a project from, you know, Consultation, discussion, negotiation, design, getting agreements, securing the funds, building it, operating it. And similarly with the developer-led model, more like the Husk Power, they, they, you know, they are designing it from, um, they've got their offer, they're looking for sites, they want to negotiate, and then but ultimately then they come into the same funnel of getting the agreements, raising the money, etc. And we identified a whole series of, of, of barriers of different degrees, so the, the people cited in consultations, there's no electrification plan. So how can we identify a study? Um, there's no, the banks won't lend us any money. So how can we raise the, the, the capital? But you, you can see that the, the range of these, and the colours were supposed to indicate which were the more or less binding ones. And then what are the programmes, what are the support services or programmes which are trying to address these barriers already? So in Tanzania, it's actually quite a lot on the go in terms of you know, policy measures. They've tried to make it, make, create a you know, um, 
a tariff regime that works for many grids. There's a, there's a credit line provided by the World Bank. There's a whole series of, of, um, of, of, of actions. But, and it is moving, but slowly. And, and in fact, the actions that are there work better for the larger mini grids with the balance sheet financing and the, the hydro and don't do an awful lot for the, for the, for the PICO um, end. So our job then was to look at these and go, well, where's, where's the gaps? Where can we top up something that's working or where can we, we add something that, isn't, that is missing? Um, this is um, another complicated slide. Sorry, this keeps coming. <laughs> this is the, um, the, a, a kind of a, a representation of uh, the DFID portfolio in terms of clean energy program. And it's, it's divided into off-grid, mini-grid and on-grid, just the same way of looking at it that I was talking about earlier. And it kind of runs from the bottom to the top in terms of the kind of the fundamentals, the, 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 the policy and the regulatory environment, the capacity, the data that you need to, to base anything on, through the project preparation phase, how do you design projects, how do you design businesses, up through the financial close, how do you actually get the money once you've designed it, and the different forms of finance that you can um, expect. And then at the top is what we might do on the operation side, so the, the, rev the revenue side. How do you kind of address the operation and maintenance cost, or use revenues as an incentive to pull through the rest? So, um, of course, I'm not by any means planning to um, talk through each one of these. You might have heard of some of them, like the REACT, it's a challenge fund in East Africa for new business ideas in clean energy and adaptation. They've had a few rounds, a number of mini-grid companies are, are getting sort of seed capital from that. The um, um, Energy and Environment Programme in Southern Africa is somewhat similar in Southern Africa and, and it provides matching grants for project and business development. The results-based financing program at the top there is the one where we provide it's kind of an off-grid feed-in tariff. It's a top-up incentive to try to, 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 to kind of incentivize action on um, energy access in the off-grid space, like a feed-in tariff top-up. So many grids is a GMG is here, and we're, think, we're seeing it as something that is kind of a, is a kind of a vertical here. It's addressing a number of barriers specific to the mini-grid sector, particularly the issue of capital. Debt, capital, the, the, how you overcome the capital barrier, the issue of preparation of projects, given that, given that many grids need prepared and designed, um, and then also some of the basic data and information that you need in order to, um, to make those happen. The, the market development side. So um, where we are in this process, sorry, I didn't realise I was going to do that. Um, is we, we put together a, a program which um, we're hoping is um, in, in towards the end of the development cycle. Um, and what we're looking at is, uh, is an approach which tries to take to address the green mini grid sector in Africa um, with a kind of using a, a coordination vehicle at the top called the High Impact Opportunity, which is something that comes through the Sustainable Energy for All initiative, which hopefully um, many of you have come across. And it's got, there's a regional component, which is about country, helping countries which haven't really thought about many grids and um, to develop their, their sectors, to get the, make sure the regulation is in the right place, um, to, to look at the, the, what, what the barriers are, and also to support research, evaluation and cross-learning between the rest of the programme. Meanwhile, there's two quite substantial investment and project preparation projects for Kenya and Tanzania, which effectively funds which are drawn down by mini-grid project developers um, and potentially communities facilitated to do so um, in terms of preparing projects and building them. With the aim being that we can try and overcome this issue with the mini-grids, which is that there, has, there isn't a big example, especially in Africa, it seems to me, and I'd be really interested to hear any challenge to this, where mini-grids have looked like they're going to achieve anything like 20-40% of unelectrified communities. So the idea is, rather than spreading our effort all over, let's try and see if we can make it happen and help make it happen in those countries which have decided they want to do it. And Kenya and Tanzania have both, to different degrees, said yes, mini grids are definitely part of our energy mix. We want to make it happen. Um, 
the mini grid's high impact opportunity, I wanted to just finish with this because it's something that might be of interest to some of you. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's still an emerging um, sort of vehicle, but sustainable energy for all is, is really the top level um, ambition internationally on clean energy, renewable energy, and energy access. Um, and it's led by the Secretary General, the World Bank President is, is the other lead, our different Secretary of State on the advisory board. Um, and it, and it, does, it does a few things. One of the things it's doing is pushing for an energy goal in the post-2015 development framework, the successor to the Millennium Development Goals. Another thing it's doing is trying to help coordinate sectoral actions within which Mini Grids is one of them. So this was just launched in the beginning of June in New York. Um, and it's got five objectives which correspond with those barriers I showed earlier. And the High Impact Opportunity seeks to support the integration of clean energy mini-grids into national and international plans, um, increase the coordination of interaction in the mini-grid sector, trying to make more joint ventures, partners for projects, uh, try to agree, in, agree, to agree and build knowledge on some of the key concepts, technologies, techniques, increase development and testing of business models through, actual, through projects, and increase the visibility and recognition of mini grids amongst financiers with a view to increasing the availability of finance. Um, this is the list of members of the HIO at the launch, and there's been another couple, including GVET, actually, which have joined since. Um, but this represents, uh, I suppose, a cross section of organisations the banks, um, NGOs, businesses, large mini grid businesses, micro mini grid businesses industry associations um, and others who, who think that there's something in this. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to overplay the role of the HIO so far, but it's something that we hope will develop in the next year to be a useful you know, vehicle. Um, and this is a little bit more information. There's an email address and there's a Twitter account, although I think there's probably two followers at the moment, so hopefully it's going to build up. Please follow. Um, and and hopefully there'll be a, sort of a, a series of things coming out of this if we try and firm up what these objectives are um, and, and what this can, group can do. But ultimately, the HIO is, is the sum, it's hopefully making the, um, the sum of the parts of all the different actions of the actors within it greater than they are on their own. So there's no new money, it's not a big fund, but it should provide a, a coordination vehicle and let us position our activities within uh, this framework rather than you know, sort of all on their own and different, uh, presented differently and understood differently. But I think that was all I wanted to say. Um, thanks very much for your time on that and I'm very happy to, for any comments or questions um, in the time we've got left. <coughs> Questions um, yeah, thanks a lot. Very good presentation. I always have this uh, confusion about mini grid and off grid. Um, I've worked as you know, uh, like when there is a small village, I don't know, 20 houses, uh, 30 houses, 40 houses. There's a little hydropower scheme, you know, not not anywhere near a grid. So it supplies half, uh, electricity to you know, 20 houses, 30 houses. Is that a mini grid and off or off grid project? What is mini grid? It's not off. So basically, the way that we're and off is okay. <laughs> so, so of course, mini grids are can be and usually are off grid. But we're not even really strict on that. So I think the definition that we have, I wish I had it now, is um, is a electrical distribution network. Mm -hmm. So distribution network. So multiple demands, houses or for, or you know uses. Um, which is either unconnected to the grid or connected to but able to operate autonomously from the main grid. So for example, a larger, a Mwenga Hydro's example I'll give you in Tanzania, they've got a hydropower, I think it's about 4 megawatts, they power a farm, I'm going to say farm, I mean like an estate, and, and some thousands of houses, and they have a grid tie so that they can export the remainder of their power. So they have three revenue sources to help them pay back their debt. And, um, and that is a mini grid in my view. Just, just in the same way as um, Meragao in India, their typical setup is 30 houses at a time, solar panels, battery, controller, distribution, 
That's also a mini grid. So, so if, if, I, I think that, that's been a useful. I'd be interested in people's feedback on that. But I think that's been a useful way of thinking about it because then you're not getting yourself tied into really binding definitions, which which exclude a particular approach. We don't know which which of those is really going to take off. Well, I mean, definition is important or not important in both ways, isn't it? But what I have you know grown in a way, understanding that an isolated scheme serving several houses was an off-grid project. Never heard of many grid, you know. Now this is sort of more catching up. I don't know, so what do you what do you think about it? You know, sort of it's yeah, no, that's true. It's, it, this is a term which has been perhaps uh, it's a new, used. It's a new term. It's a new, new term which has been used. But uh, the concept existed. I, think, yeah, concept I don't have any problem with that. Yeah, you can call it anything if you, you look like. At, if you look at China, they have done this kind of thing. Like, like Nepal. Nepal, you know, Nepal also have done. Hundreds so of separate things like that, yeah, yeah. Separate things uh, locally, local resource utilization. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then, at that, from there, I think the question that comes perhaps is, how then you can, uh, if you are creating such uh, isolated systems, in the future are you going to integrate them? Or, and, uh, uh, what would be the way of doing that? And there comes the issues of standardization and, uh, yes. and uh, also maybe upscaling. Yeah. Um, just to jump yeah, in on okay. that. Sorry, just to jump in on that. There's an, there's an interesting conversation on, oh, sorry, my name is John Clove from the Low Covenant. Uh, I'm involved in one of the uses funded projects, um, the solar nano grid, to make the situation more complicated. Yeah. And so, an interesting conversation on research games. I don't know how many people here are, are so signed up to that, that's quite a useful thing about what constitutes micro, mini, nano, pico, and all these other kind of efforts. And really, they're, they're, they're even amongst the, the more technical, like I'm a human geographer myself, so uh, I have no knowledge of these things. But to accept say they really are social constructs as much as anything else. And there's simply ways of describing differential levels of, of various solar PV arrays, uh, and they have no more real meaning than that. Sometimes they are used to address the functionality, sometimes they're used to, uh, to, to describe the spatiality or the power output, and so on. But, but it's not something that one needs to get hung up on too much. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, be honest with you, all I hear is you're replicating history. Go back to the late 1800s. It started with individual estates electrifying. Then you had Pearl Street in New York that electrified three blocks. A month later, London had five blocks electrified. You know, so you're just following that same path of 130 years ago. Yes and no. Um, obviously there was no alternative. Was but in the sense of just the scaling. Upwards. Yeah, and there's been sort of, I think there's been cycles of this. I mean, yes, I mean, I've been to visit like little micro mill powered, you know, hydro schemes in the UK, which predated the grid. And then when the grid arrived, then those were all put out of business. And actually, I think we're now cycling back in a way to mini grids and smart grids also because we want to have decentralized power. Um, and so I think, I think the technologies have also moved on in a way. Um, in terms of the distribution, in terms of the power management, and, and so that kind of thing. But, but you're right. In a, in a way, I find that that's one of the challenges that the people then sometimes throw back at the sector. Well, it's been around for so long. Why are we not doing more of it? And, and so I think that's why we need to just kind of make, see if what we can do is, is a bit different now. Because, and, and the same with the solar lighting. The solar lanterns, people will remember that from the late 90s. People came up with that idea. And it wasn't catching on. It wasn't catching on. It wasn't cheap enough. It wasn't smart enough. The, the products weren't quite right for the market, and then I think now you're seeing there is some scale. So I think similarly with many grids, it, I think there's still a few changes, and, and some people still say, I mean, I've talked to SolarAid um, in Tanzania, they say, what are you mucking about with these mini grids for? You know, you just need to do every single house can have a solar panel, a battery, and, a, and some lights. Why are you doing distribution? They talk to Firefly Solar, um, and they say, those guys haven't got it right, there's still a big opportunity for mini grids, and it's cheaper for me to put in uh, a box here, a rank of panels, and then run some wires, and it is to put in 30 panels, wires, and boxes. And, and, that's, and I think my perception, and being some people's views, is that the household side has got, off, has got off faster because it's not relying on any kind of coordination amongst the community. Whereas if you just try to convince one person to make that one decision, and then you can have that one thing on their house, and it's bought and sold and it's done. Whereas a mini grid is a, is a piece of infrastructure that, that has there's a degree of agreement about what you pay for it, who owns it. These issues, I think, have, have held it back. I don't think, I don't think they're insurmountable. I have a follow-up question. 
then it's just what level of electrification do you consider the minimum? I mean, you can put in a, a two kilowatt system and give a single 40 watt light bulb to 50 yeah. houses. Yeah, I think. Um, what, I mean, is there what's the minimum? So you'd like to we don't have a minimum. I think that we are poorly positioned to decide that. If anything, it might be the government of the country that would decide the minimum. But what is I, I typically would leave it to the market. So what, what we're, one of the things we're funding through ESMAP at the moment of the World Bank is this multi-tier energy access sort of index, which, will, which gives you a sense of the quality of the services at different tiers between what we might have here, full power, as much as you want, as often as you want, down through the different levels through to you know a solar light and then two bulbs and a charger and then etc. So we're not we're not in our in our thinking on this we're not specifying we're we're saying clearly the higher the better but also recognising that costs more and you'll then potentially exclude poorer consumers from it if you do that. So we're trying we're I guess sensitive to that issue but not trying to make a, make a, put a threshold on it ourselves. Single energy for all may have to put a threshold on it for universal access, but that's a, that's a question that they'll come to or be a broader decision. One question. Uh, yeah, great. Yeah. One question. Uh, I'm here from Francisco Union Collaborating Center. Uh, very small question with regard to this uh, mini grid Africa proposal. Do you also consider, for instance, brownfield uh, hybrid projects also uh, a part of it? Um, we work quite closely with Dean Cooper. I don't know if you know Dean yeah. UNEP, who the Frankfurt Collaborating Schools, I guess you're involved in that. No, the UNEP project is much more open and focused also on the brownfield side. This project we prepared primarily is about doing about greenfields, it's about new access. It's not about greening existing mini grids. Um, I'm not saying that in the Kenya call documents that will totally exclude that possibility, but we would be always be prioritizing a new connection. It's an access, it's a clean access program. Um, coming back to this lightning versus mini grids um, issue, I think one, one thing that makes lightning much easier is also standardization. Right? You mentioned that it's a standardized product which was improved and is now looking like it's taken off. Um, and you also mentioned one of the five barriers, the key barriers, standardization was on there. So my question would be, and perhaps it's a bit a question to everyone who has experience in that, how standardizable is a mini grid? And I'd like to have your, yeah. your take on it because you have, yeah. seem to have yeah. a very global overview. Mm. I think, to be honest, the big strength of solar is its standardization. So solar is more or less on most places and it's a solid state, it's a panel, you lock it onto a building, you tie it up with some charge controllers, and some batteries, and then you have some wires and some meters. So it's extremely potato stamp of it all. And um, I think that's what, that's what Mayor Gow are doing. Um, and they've got this offer where they can build a mini grid that serves 30 households for $800. And so they say, you know, and, they, and then they can charge a fee which gives them a payback in just over three years. So that, and, and that's two bulbs and a charger. And it's standard flat rate. It's not per kilowatt hour. Um, and you know, and India always has different benefits in some ways. They've got a really good network of you know distribution and payment collection. Very standard. Hydro can only ever be so standard because every single site is different. Wind, I think, is likely to be part of a mix of something, but it's quite dependent on the on what's there. Actually. Um, IED were very strong on um, biomass gasification as, as being part of the mix. And if you're right next to the husk power being exhibit A, if you've got a big supply of rice, husk, and you have the right burner, you can do a pretty standard offer. So I think it varies. Um, I think what's quite encouraging is the increasing standardization of components. So Firefly, for example, have a, 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 a charge and, and battery management kind of box which you can plug in whichever renewables and demand you want. I think that will, I think that kind of product then takes out of the hand of the developer. So the developer has to worry about how do I have contracts and sell power and I'll, maybe the maybe the technology bit is then done by a, a partner. May I ask the <laughs> <laughs> Um, just following on from the last question, which I thought, uh, and standardisation I see is a big issue. Oh, by the way, Paul Riley, University of Nottingham. Um, 
who is driving the standardisation? Um, let me explain my question. Uh, you mentioned about PV, and yes, there are products on the market. But when I look for, uh, uh, say, a battery system, lithium now is much cheaper than lead acid in terms of cost per cycle. Uh, and yet there's hardly any standards for charging lithium batteries at the low cost that we need for these, um, uh, for these mini or micro grids. Um, and I think the big um, silicon houses that are making the chips that could drive the cost down and not perceiving that this is a massive market for them. So one of the, one of the things that I, I think needs to happen is we need to decide on the standards and then somebody needs to start pushing the industry as well as the end consumers to get the costs down and to get the volume up or the other way around probably. Mm. So who is driving the standardisation is, is the question technically. I'm not sure that there is anybody really at the moment. If you look at, um, you know, say the cookstove sector, the Global Alliance is driving that process with ISO. Um, if you look at the solar lighting sector, it's Lighting Africa, uh, you know, who've, who've driven that, that process. I'm not sure, in the grid, there isn't anyone yet. We have it as one of the five objectives of this HIO. Maybe this HIO will provide the platform. It's currently a cooperation, it's not an organization. Um, so, I think that, that, to be honest, I think the space is open for that. Um, I know, one other quick thing though I would just say is, when I say standard, I don't necessarily mean standards. <coughs> it doesn't necessarily mean an agreed regimented standard, it mean off the shelf products oh. that work. That, that, so that a developer doesn't have to rethink how do I integrate my panels and my charge controller and my users. Can I just kind of, in the way that Merigat, Merigat, that's probably their, their business model is part of it, but what they've done is they've just standardised a, 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 a set of products which works at that cost. And, I think, and so I do think that there may be a role for standards. But I, I'm, I guess I'm thinking more about standardised components within, or even design approaches, um, as opposed to... Yeah, I was thinking of that as well. But the way it happens in other areas is there's a committee, globally committed, that decide on what the standards should be. Then the chip manufacturers know that if they, if they spend a lot of money developing that chip, they can get the cost down, and then it all works. I don't see the same thing here. I wonder whether DFID or, or perhaps some of the other agencies could, uh, could start thinking about this area to, 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 to coordinate and get this to happen? I mean, it's not impossible. I mean, if, if, on, the, on the hopes that this program um, that we've been working on is shortly able to go ahead, then there is a, there's a regional market development element and there's a knowledge and um, kind of, yeah, knowledge kind of component to that. So it's entirely possible that those elements, which we expect to be run by some of the MDBs, uh, could take up this issue. Because it is a, is a sector enabling issue. Um, so, yeah, let's keep it to raise. We'll take two more questions. Vic first and then you can Vic Green of Norfolk University. I'm just interested in what role, if any, do you think information systems play in the operation of uh, mini grids in developing countries? Because I'm thinking of Jeremy Rifkin and his sort of uh, attempt to popularize distributed generation plus internet connectivity. Uh, but I suspect that only really works in developed countries. And I wondered if, if you see any role for that kind of idea in developing countries. I think it's very likely to be a big part of the picture going forward. I think um, if you look at some of the companies like Product Health, Product Health have basically got a remote monitoring um, system which you can then plug in, which manages things and then broadcasts into the internet what's happening on your mini grid. Uh, Firefly, all of their um, systems have that capacity. Devergy in Tanzania, that, that's basically their thing. They're monitoring these from, from, from a, a distance. So, yeah, I think remote monitoring and status and um, reporting so you can see what's happening and then also can demonstrate to your financiers, to, your, to the world that these, these are working. I think will be a big part of the story. I think that's where the IT kind of technology is a big difference from the earlier experiences. And I think that we also need to, and I think it's Power High are another example. Power High, there's a lot of companies from the West Coast, uh, you know, Silicon Valley type companies looking at this and saying there's an opportunity here, and they want to use that kind of technology, and they have to because they're happy around the world. Um, but they will, you know, have local offices too. But I think that it's really important, I think, to try and, you know, Recognise this is going to be a, a tick, a high, to some extent high tech in order to make it work. In the same way the solar lanterns have to be. You can't have a low tech solar lantern, I don't think, because it has to work. Okay, this is the last question. Uh, Mahmoud Swayze, University of Nottingham. 
Uh, thanks a lot for the talk. I would like to check and ask about the view for the Department of the International Development, which this program is running. I mean, your view. Are you planning to use this program to support people with lighting, or are you planning to use this program to support the communities with opportunity to, for development, like uh, many manufacturing or something like that? So what you, what's your aim and objectives? I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a log frame, as you can imagine, um, and so the top of the log frame, more or less, is clean energy access. We're, we want millions of people to start getting their power from mini grids, clean energy mini grids. Um, we want, how do we want that to happen? Is more your, is it communities, is it developers? I think, predominantly, we're, we're open to both. This um, preparation impact fund would be a call, would basically take the form of a call, which could be applied to by predominantly developers, many good people who want to build and operate mini grids, um, but potentially also communities and counties. We're not, we're not necessarily going to, um, you know, limit it on the basis of what kind of organisation you are, but who's able to build mini grids and who wants to build mini grids and who has some money to then match with ours to then go ahead and do it and have the community consultation do the technical development. Um, we think in that preparation fund, a degree of community mobilisation we anticipate would be part of it, potentially delivered from by NGOs or community-based organisations. But I think the balance of evidence, I think, is that you need that, the, the drive of a, de of a developer, somebody who, they, who wants to build a mini-grid and who wants to go out and make more of them, and who's making money from the tariffs to then finance the making of more of them. Um, but, you know, we're not totally set on that. We're, we're trying not to pick winners. We're trying to you know, be open to them proposing and then who can make progress. The second part of that is the impact fund. So there's also an element of that which will be about what do you do once you've got power. And, I, and, we've, and the, co the fund is all good also in, in the event that's approved. Everything we have to take is, <laughs> is um, provisional here. Um, would also be available to things like finance institutions or the, or the counties who want to then help fund appliances, people to use the power, that kind of thing. The investment element is about capital. Um, and we'd be looking to who can come forward with projects which need the least amount of public support. You know, if you say we absolutely need a grant to do this, then we'll say, okay, well, how do you justify that? Now, somebody else comes along and said, well, we need half that grant to do this, then probably they're going to be the ones that we support because we're looking to see how much we can get done with the least amount of money. And, and even better will be the company that comes along and says, or the, the promoter who says, we don't need a grant, we need a loan. We need a loan to do this. If you give us a loan, we'll pay it back and we'll build more mini grids. But we recognise that we may, they're not all going to be in that first category necessarily at the outset. So but that, but that's to give you a sense of the direction of travel and our preference and why we have a degree of, of competition in it to the extent possible. That, that was, that's, like, that's the thinking. Um, how that lands fully in the Kenyan and Tanzanian uh, sort of regulatory and sort of context is something that we're going to need to, we'll, we'll, we'll be worked through, you know, we'll continue to be worked through. Is there a... Thank you very much. Thank you.